Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar where we ask the question, can drones help to conserve the planet's natural resources? I'm Erica Logan, Senior Manager for Technology Assessment and Resource Development at the Global Electronics Council. I'll be the moderator for today's discussion. This is our final webinar in our technology and conservation webinar series, highlighting new and important ways that technology is conserving and protecting our natural world. Our webinar series also aligns closely with GEC's Catalyst Awards program, which recognizes innovations and in technology that advance sustainability globally. And we find it particularly fitting as Earth Day is upon us. Today's webinar features four presenters whom I will introduce in a moment. But first, a few reminders. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website for people who were unable to join live and for sharing with your colleagues. Also, we are looking forward to a robust Q&A session at the end of the presentations. We encourage you to submit questions by typing them into the questions window. And we'll get to as many as possible once the final speaker has completed their presentation. And as a reminder, all attendee lines have been muted. Um, starting our discussion will be Ms. Nancy Gillis, the CEO of the Global Electronics Council. She will be followed by Dr. Ved Chiriat, Director of Advanced Sex Sensing at the NASA Ames Research Center. We'll then hear from Ms. Nina Kencheva Tushev, co-founder of Tushev Aerials and a senior policy analyst with the United Nations Development Program. We'll conclude with Mr. Burhan Yasin, the Chief Operating Officer for the Rainforest Connection. And we're also pleased to introduce Mr. Kike Calvo. Um, Kike is an award-winning photographer and author focused on culture and the environment. While Kiki could not join us today, he produced a short video for us highlighting his pioneer work, pioneering work on the use of drones to produce aerial photography as art and as a tool of research and conservation. His images have been published in National Geographic, The New York Times, The Washington Post, uh, and many other notable publications. Uh, we're trying to add the link to the video in the chat window. It's, it's a really very large file, um, but it will also be available on our website. And so with that, um, let us begin. And uh, great, and if we could advance to the next slide. Nancy Gillis is the CEO of the Global Electronics Council. Nancy has more than 20 years experience leveraging sustainability to increase competitiveness, reduce risk, and foster innovation in the public and private sector. Before joining GEC, Nancy was a senior executive with Ernst & Young, where she managed client engagements related to supply chain resiliency and sustainable procurement for Fortune 100 companies. She also launched and served as global lead for Ernst & Young's resilient and responsible supply chains suite of services. Nancy joined Ernst & Young from the US General Services Administration, where she was responsible for developing sustainability related supplier evaluation criteria and expanding the use of sustainability standards in federal procurements. Nancy, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Erica, and welcome to all of the speakers, as well as all of those who are listening and viewing us today. It is exciting to come to the conclusion of this particular webinar series and the focus that we've had on the role that technology plays in biodiversity conservation. And I'm really excited about this closing webinar of the series because it does address a impact that is near and dear to my heart, which is looking at the role that technology plays in actually supporting and empowering indigenous peoples and the work that they do that is necessary and valued for biodiversity conservation. I know we're gonna hear a little bit about that, but before we hear about what our speakers are prepared to share with us, let me share a little bit with you about who is the Global Electronics Council. As you see, we are a mission-driven non-for-profit 
we seek to actually create a more sustainable and just world, we look at doing that in two ways. One, we focus on technology. In fact, we couldn't be speaking with you today without technology. So we focus on making sustainable and circular technology available. And we actually support institutional purchasers and the power that they have as large-scale purchasers in making those more sustainable and circular IT products and services come onto the market. So if you hear about the Global Electronics Council, you frequently hear about us in the terms of procurement and how we can help purchasers, again, buy more credible, sustainable, and circular IT products and services. But we're not only just about making the technology better, we're also about leveraging technology. And that's really what the webinar focuses on today. How do you leverage technology for a more sustainable and just world? Next slide. So what the Global Electronics Council does is, as I mentioned, support those institutional purchasers, public and private sector, globally. And we have a number of freely available tools and resources to do that. We kind of see ourselves at the intersection of the relationship between those who make, the producers and manufacturers, and those who buy, the purchasers. And we seek to leverage that purchasing power by giving them resources such as an eco-label. We do manage the most used eco-label in the IT sector called EP. And if you go to our website, it's globalelectronicscouncil.org, you will see a link to the EP Ecolabel and all of the IT products from both major global brands as well as small and medium providers available for you. So when you're wanting to buy credible, sustainable IT products, such as televisions or laptops, tablets, mobile phones, you can look to EP to help. But we don't only manage the leading eco-label in the IT sector, we also put out additional guidance, such as purchaser guides. And I'm proud to announce that we actually are updating a purchaser guide that we put out in 2017 on how to address labor and human rights issues in the IT sector, particularly if you're doing IT procurement. That guide will be launched later on this month. So do look for announcements from us if you're interested in the revised version of that guide. And then we also do training. And in fact, I'm very proud of the fact that we have partnered with a leading legal institute in Europe, specifically in Germany, called ERA. That leading uh, legal institute has a long history in teaching about public procurement. And what we've done in our partnership with them is come up with a training that allows purchasers who are based in Europe to better understand how can they leverage public procurement in the EU space towards sustainability. So again, if you're interested in participating in this training, please go to our website at greenelectronicscouncil.org and sign up. So why are we as GEC focused on drones? Why are we participating and have sponsored this particular webinar. Next slide. Well, it's for a number of reasons. One is a recognition of just the threat that biodiversity is under. And you'll hear a lot from the speakers much better versed in this topic than I on what that threat actually is. And the threat isn't just one in which, oh, we are going to lose an important aspect of quality of life if we see a reduction in biodiversity. No, that reduction actually has an impact on our economy, right? Those fishermen who actually depend on fish and just the oceans for a way of life. It has for our health. Where do we think some of these new medicines actually originate, right? And of course, biodiversity is essential to our fight against climate change. So when we talk about the importance of biodiversity, you can well imagine why the Global Electronics Council is interested. And we were very interested in understanding what's the new technology that could innovatively help both monitor, assess, and address 
the loss of biodiversity. And technology that's accessible, not just to big organizations, but also accessible to people in the field, such as indigenous peoples. So this is why we're very interested in this topic and why we're bringing this webinar to you today. Now, I do have to give a call out to a leader in the field of indigenous people's rights that we just recently lost. And it is our honor to dedicate this webinar to Pamela Kraft, who is the founder of Tribal Link and was a tireless advocate for indigenous peoples everywhere. So with that though, let me turn this webinar back over to you, Erica, and again, to the fantastic speakers who have joined us, our deep appreciation for your time and for the insights and knowledge that you will share. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for, for providing that overview of GEC, but also for setting the stage for an informative um, discussion. Really excited. So let me introduce our first guest presenter, uh, Dr. Ved Chiriath. And apologies if I mispronounced um, your last name, Ved. Um, Ved is with the National Aeronautics and Space Administra Administration, better known to most of us as NASA. Uh, Ved directs NASA's Laboratory for Advanced Sensing. Uh, he's located in Silicon Valley, California. His multidisciplinary team develops new instrumentation for underwater, airborne, and spaceborne remote sensing and communications, um, as well as um, developing machine learning algorithms to process all of this data uh, and enable insights. Uh, Vet is the inventor of fluid cam, fluid lensing, MIDAR, NEMO-NET, and a plasma actuated drone. He has received numerous awards for his, inner, his inventions, um, as well as his social activism. Ved, um, thank you for being here. Over to you. All right, there we go. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having there you me. Are. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so hopefully you can all see that. I, I'm yes. delighted to be here um, as a consummate consumer, uh, you know, in the government sector of electronics, particularly drones. Uh, I'd love to just talk about what, how we use them as a space agency to study our home world and protect life on it. So I'll share a little bit today about our fluid cam and NemoNet projects, and then end on um, something that you can actually participate in as a citizen science video game. So I'm actually a, sort of a recovering astrophysicist. I did my PhD in, in aerospace, and I got to NASA and realized that, you know, as of 2021, we still only mapped about 8% of our seafloor. 99% uh, of the habitable volume of our planet is in the ocean. We're sort of the exception on land. And we've actually mapped um, all of Mars and the moon at a spatial resolution of 30 meters or finer, which is startling because nobody lives there. <laughs> you know, everything's on that one blue planet. So the focus of my lab and for the last decade has been filling in that technology gap, helping us to map um, what we cannot see on our planet, which all too often is synonymous with what we cannot protect or understand as being lost. Uh, the oceans in particular are taking the brunt of our anthropogenic pressures. With um, ocean acidification, most of the CO2 um, that we produce, the excess of it, 80%, 90%, is directly absorbed through the ocean surface. This is causing the ocean to acidify, and organisms, calcium carbonate organisms in particular, like corals, are dissolving. They cannot form the shells that they need or the structures they need to, to live. The ocean is also heating up as we increase the temperature of our atmosphere through these greenhouse gases being trapped. Um, it's causing coral bleaching, which is what you can see in this slide, where these zooxanthellae, the symbiotic algae inside the coral jump ship, and they completely turn white, exposing their skeleton. Corals can recover from this, but unfortunately, we're, we're hitting them with multiple double whammies. There's acidification, heating, overfishing often, and then, you know, the errant tourists stepping on it or bringing coral reef unsafe sunscreen into that kind of environment. So it's really crucial we, we protect these systems. Uh, we made the prediction back when we launched NemoNet last year on Earth Day that the next big antiviral drug, possibly to treat COVID-19, will likely come out of um, a reef system. And sure enough, just a few months ago, a new drug was derived out of a sea squirt from a marine um, environment that is 30 times more effective at treating COVID than remdesivir. So 
we ignore these systems at our own peril, and that's kind of why we've been focusing on trying to map them as best we can. So NASA does this from orbit and from aircraft and drones. This is a picture from space of what uh, a, a typical coral reef environment looks like. This is in the American Samoa. But there are a lot of challenges with looking through the ocean from orbit um, or the air. The first is just attenuation. There's not much light. You can see this when you go to a swimming pool or the ocean. You can't see very deep, <laughs> and that's because light is absorbed very quickly. Uh, within the atmosphere, there's just a few windows um, in the spectrum from the sun where light penetrates. So we have the visible bands and the radio bands, which are used in astronomy. But beyond that, you know, everything that's very short wavelength, we're shielded from, so UV light um, and finer. And then also on the long wavelength, there's a few other bands that are um, pretty strongly attenuated. And then once you hit water, you can see on the right, you know, everything to the right of one micron on that spectrum, so darker than red, gets absorbed. And really, you're just left with the visible bands of light that penetrate the ocean. Um, and the one that goes deepest is around the blue color uh, at 400 nanometers, and that goes to about 100 meters depth. The average depth of the ocean is 4,000 meters, so you can see the problem with imaging things uh, through that. The second problem is refraction. This is something you learn about in high school. You have water at the surface and it meets air. And where those two fluids meet, there's a large index of refraction jump. And that means that when light passes through this interface, it can cause significant distortions. And right now, this is actually um, a larger limiting factor for our satellites and our aircraft to look through the ocean surface. It's this distortion effect from ocean waves that can vary as a function of sea state, but typically will reduce the resolution of an otherwise very capable satellite to one to 10 meters over a reef system. And this is particularly um, concerning because most of these reef systems change on very fine scales over time. And we can unfortunately only detect large scale uh, ecosystem collapse when it's too late, when it's already at the 10 meter scale and higher. So I set out to try to, to solve this problem with an instrument called Fluid Chem, which is a technology I developed during my doctorate called Fluid Lensing. Here you can see what it looks like. It's a, built into a very small, um, what we call a CubeSat satellite form factor to eventually fly into orbit. But what this does is we're trying to get to this picture. If we, if we had a, a test target of a coral at depth, uh, without any fluid, you would, you would see this top left picture, the terrestrial equivalent, right? Uh, if we introduce water, you see the effects of absorption and attenuation. This is at a depth of four and a half meters. If you have a high-speed camera, this is the view you get from a drone or a satellite, a very high-performance satellite, you can see all of the distortion effects caused by the fluid. Uh, magnification, demagnification, as well as these bright bands of light called caustics that dance on the floor, those are actually coming from sunlight being focused by lenses uh, at that surface of the water. And prior to this technology, we were, we were doing this mean image. So when we take a picture of something, it usually takes about a tenth of a second, and those waves start uh, distorting together and form a very blurry picture. So you can see the effect of this uh, refraction uh, causing you know, distortions at depth. And the fluid lensing result is in, the, is in the top right, where each of the positive magnification events uh, from the fluid have been determined and then used to actually create a very high resolution picture of what's at depth. And then the caustics are tracked to create this integration. So the mean image and this fluid lensing solution are taken at the same time, about a tenth of a second, but one actually has much higher resolution and um, depth capability. You'll notice it's even better than the flat fluid case, showing that you can actually exploit these waves to better the performance of the imaging system and see what's at depth. So we've been naturally flying this on drones all around the world, mapping uh, coral reefs, which are particularly uh, threatened right now. Here you can see what some of um, the caustics look like from above the surface. And this is from a campaign uh, to American Samoa where we're looking at a fringing reef. And this will give you an idea of what the technology can do um, just on a drone platform. So here you'll see what some of the raw data look like. Here there's not just refraction, but also reflection, strong reflection from the surface. And then we have the fluid lensing solution. And this is a 3D um, map or image created at sub centimeter scale. And this was the first time we've ever been able to peel back the ocean surface at the same resolution a diver might have going through this environment, which is you know, still the go-to you know, method of doing anything underwater to send divers. But when you send people there, typically you, know, you can't survey very large areas um, and people make you know, mistakes, get nibbled by sharks. 
going by, um, and then that's at about uh, six centimeters in length. If you're just if you're curious for the scale, so this technology allowed us to really map systems at unprecedented scales, and we could do it over really large areas using drones as a platform to do that. Uh, we've done field campaigns all over the world to try to to gather data. But um, this is sort of talking to the point of, you know, well, how do drones help us answer global questions, right? Typically, the, um, the con that's listed for drones is that they're very small scale impact. And that's generally true. You, you cannot map the entire planet like we do with the Landsat satellite every eight days, um, the coverage or the perspective. But we, what we decided to do is um, just target areas that have very high a coral benthic diversity with this technology. So each time you go to an island, we'll produce terabytes and terabytes of data. It's a lot of data. Um, and we try to use that data to merge with satellite data to then form a global model. So this is an example of a, a small section of a data set that's about 0.1% from our latest campaign in Guam. We'll be going back there next month. Gives you an idea of um, the depth capabilities of the instrument. This is, goes down to about 45 foot depth. And you can see um, how it compares to the satellite view in that area. This is actually a popular tourist destination as well. So the government of Guam is working with us very closely on making sure we can project these environments and also educate people in the process. And you can see, you know, there's these bomb holes were actually created um, uh, after World War II um, during a large bombing event on the island. But then corals grew within these uh, deep channels, and it kind of forms a very interesting environment. Here you see mostly varieties corals. And um, with the new implementation of, on the technology, we can also detect uh, moving objects in relation to the wave field. So we can count you know, larger um, animals within the water column. Here we've detected a reef shark. Even though the reef shark does not appear in the fluid lensing solution, it uh, appears in our, in our change detection. And we can track schools efficient things. So we can not only understand benthic diversity, but also everything that's there that's a key component. Sharks, in particular, are a key ecosystem um, species they tell you whether that reef is healthy or not often so with with all of this you know imaging the question is how do you how do you process that data um, it's not easy to look at terabytes and petabytes of data sets particularly in 3d and again the the reach of drones is often limited to just small areas at a time we've maybe mapped 100 square kilometers um, or a little bit more than that but there's 65,000 square kilometers of, of reefs around the world in the ship a machine learning tool on our supercomputer to try to help all of the other assets we have perform better imaging. And here you can see, you know, even the, the commercial thing you'll, um, you'll see when you load up your phone is likely Landsat data or worldview data at the bottom that's at the two meter resolution. And it's very hard to discern corals at that scale. But if you have some fluid lensing data from that region, it's pretty easy to identify what pixel is rock, what pixel is coral use that information to actually train a network to determine the object give and so we call need launch lap in the about world shallow technique where we do a few um, a few different uh, field campaigns and then use that data to augment satellite data. So I'll just show a trailer of uh, how this works. We actually perform all of the training in a video game, which you can play and download for your iPhone, Android, Windows, or Mac desktop, um, and help contribute to all of this uh, mapping that we're doing and classification. That then creates a global habitat map that's used directly by the United Nations SDG uh, 14 for tracking marine ecosystems, for looking at degradation over time. The final products will come out in uh, end of this year. So I'll just run this uh, trailer. What if you could help NASA create a map of the ocean floor with just the tip of your finger? The ocean, teeming with life. It defines our blue planet, drives our ecosystem, and regulates our climate. Coral reefs are one of the most diverse and important systems in the ocean. They're also becoming an important source of medicines for some of the world's deadliest diseases. But they're dying at unprecedented rates due to rising temperatures. But we don't know how much we're losing or how much our climate is changing. We can't. 
until we determine how much help we bring exists now. And the only way we can know that is with your help. NASA Neonet is a game where you classify the world's coral reefs by painting on real-life images scanned from the ocean floor using a revolutionary instrument that lets us see beneath the waves at unprecedented resolutions. Our oceans are so vast, it would take us two million years to classify the world's coral reefs by hand. The classifications you create are sent to our teams of NASA scientists at home base to teach our supercomputer to classify coral reefs on a global scale. Every contribution you make brings us closer to solving this problem. Join the NASA team to help us understand these amazing ecosystems. Take command of your research vessel and learn about all the different types of coral. <laughs> we must keep the ocean alive. It supports our life as we know it. Together, we can create a global data set of coral reefs and build a better understanding of how to save these aquatic worlds one piece of coral at a time. Good luck, and welcome to the NASA Nemo Net team. So if you'd like to learn more about the technical background behind the instruments or, or the technology called NemoNet, um, you can scan that QR code or look at some of these publications that are also on the, the NemoNet homepage. And uh, again, it's a real pleasure to be here with you all um, right before Earth Day. And uh, I thank you for your time. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Ved. Um... You know, I, I have, I think many may not have appreciated that NASA's work is enabling conservation of marine habitat ecosystems right here on Earth. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I also have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, uh, Ms. Nina Kancheva Tushev. Um, Ms. Nanik, uh, Ms. Kancheva is a Senior Policy Advisor on Indigenous Peoples and Local Community Engagement at UNDP. Nina is also the co-founder of Two Chefs Aerials, an initiative to democratize drone technology for indigenous peoples, local communities, organizations, and individuals to use drones for environmental and humanitarian goals. Understanding that we cannot solve the planetary emergencies of climate change and biodiversity loss without their knowledge, experience, and decision-making, Nina works to establish and support initiatives and convenings that place the needs and priorities of indigenous peoples and local communities at the center. Nina, thank you for being here. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation and uh, thank you for all the other presenters. Um, I'm gonna start my presentation. Okay. Great, uh, my apologies. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you about today is how in my work I've used drones to help indigenous peoples map, monitor, and protect their territories. And this is um, a decade's worth of experience in applying this new technology to environmental efforts and specifically to strengthening um, the rights of indigenous peoples. And the reason why um, we work with indigenous peoples is because, well, this is part of the work and the commitment I've made to be an ally to indigenous peoples around the world and use my privilege in sitting in an institution like the United Nations to open up political space for um, indigenous peoples to advocate on their own behalf and to be able to um, negotiate uh, the outcomes that they need to continue to protecting their environment. But you might know some facts about indigenous peoples. They comprise around 6% of the world's population, over 470 million people around the world. They manage or hold tenure over 25% of the world's land surface and support about 80% of global biodiversity. And their cosmovision and traditional knowledge are essential to solving the biodiversity and climate crisis. Uh, they have protected their territories over millennia and research shows that some of the best protected intact forests, for example, are found on indigenous territories. Um, so this is, I, I wanna, before we go further, I just wanna say a few words about um, how this work came about and how I uh, co-founded to shift serials. 
So about 10 years ago, I had been working on efforts to reduce and stop deforestation in tropical countries, supporting indigenous peoples to be part of various processes at the UN, at the global level. And um, my partner was very involved in building remote control airplanes. And um, we, of course, started flying them. And I learned to fly remote control airplanes. And the videos that we started producing, I was sharing with my, my colleagues, my indigenous friends, um, and it, it, immediately they saw the value of having an inexpensive tool that can put a camera in the sky. Um, of course, satellites had been in existence, but the data from satellites was not accessible to indigenous peoples until recently. Um, money had to, you know, it was expensive to purchase the satellite data. Recently, you might know that um, Norway made all of its tropical forest data available for free, which is incredible. So if anyone is interested, you can definitely uh, go to Global Forest Watch and, and um, there's trainings that are available for how to use that spatial data. But it was very important. It was, it was uh, the indigenous peoples that I was working with, specifically the Mesoamerican Alliance of Indigenous Peoples, um, based in Mesoamerica, in the Caribbean, uh, were, were instrumental in um, really asking us to create a project to train some of the indigenous communities they work with uh, on the feasibility of using remote control airplanes at the time. This was back in 2013. And we designed this project to test how well we can fly a uh, train and fly drones in the rainforest situation. So basically, we had the training in the, the, in the Peruvian rainforest and we were using kind of big clunky airplanes and it was difficult. It was difficult because there was no internet connection. Um, it took many days to train people. It was not as easy as it is today to use an off-the-shelf quadcopter, which is much easier to learn to fly. Um, so the challenges were there, but it was also very clear that the data we accessed, it took about half an hour to monitor an oil spill. I'll talk a little bit about that later. And it was clear that drones can be really powerful tools to help indigenous peoples monitor their territories. So here we have some examples of uh, one of these trainings in Peru that we build indigenous leadership and capacity in using frontier technology we can obtain accurate field data for effective governance of natural resources and also detect threats to critical landscapes in remote locations. As you know, there's a lot of illegal activities happening on indigenous territories. So it's very important to have this tool at the disposal of indigenous peoples. So as I mentioned, um, you can see here some of our early examples. On the left is one of our Delta wings. This was a preferred, and here on the bottom, this is in um, near Sedona. But <clears throat> we preferred this tool because uh, it allowed us to go very far. You could easily go uh, beyond 10, 12, 15 miles. You could go way far, farther if uh, there was no radio distortion. Um, so the Delta wing was a preferred tool in the early days, uh, about 2010, 2011. However, the challenge of using a Delta wing is that it's, um, it's difficult to learn, to fly it. Uh, it really takes quite a few weeks and months to practice and, and to become a good pilot. It also, in the rainforest, um, in the rainforest landscape, it's a very difficult tool to use because you need clearing uh, for landing and for takeoff. So this was a challenging tool to use. You see there quadcopters, and I have one here that I'll show you. Uh, right here, we have uh, one of our handmade, we make them in our studio, in our lab, quadcopter that um, is really good in the rainforest because it can take off and land even on a boat. We're on the river, take take off and land. But as Ved was saying earlier, really the capacity of drones to cover large territories is limited. And of the quadcopters, it's even more limited because the battery that this quadcopter can carry uh, doesn't last beyond maybe in the large drones, 25, 30 minutes. Um, so there are some challenges, but I wanted to show you a bit of footage uh, flying through and above a forest, something that can be obtained 
Um, hopefully this will work great. Okay, and hopefully you can see it. It's a little choppy because of the connection, but um, this is just some eye candy, <laughs> some flights we've we've done. This is in Hawaii in particular, um, but it, using drones allows anyone to obtain beautiful video. A lot of this video also has, uh, depending on what uh, camera you're using, you can get uh, good data on Sorry, good data on the, the height. I, I did something here with my, my screen. Hopefully you can continue seeing it. Um, so what I wanted to also talk about is that there are some situations we I wanted to talk a little bit about my work at UNDP. So my work at UNDP is with uh, the Nature for Development team and the goal of the Nature for Development team is to place nature at the core of development and uh, specifically my job is to support indigenous peoples and local communities in that process. One of the projects that we have is the Equator Initiative, which awards the Equator Prize. And the Equator Prize seeks to identify community grassroots level best practice examples of biodiversity conservation, addressing climate change, climate mitigation and adaptation. And through that Equator Prize, we found some incredible examples of community, communities using technology, specifically drone technology as well, this one here is a is a short video. Just want to show you one little um, component of this video, which talks about a community in Peru which won the Equator Prize in 2019 uh, that has been using spatial data to reduce deforestation on their territory from five to zero percent. Um, they did that with uh, receiving alerts from satellites through Global Forest Watch using drones to to then once the alert of the specific um, landscape was identified to fly a drone and and see and get much closer resolution as bed talk the uh, drones have the capacity to obtain uh, much higher resolution footage and imagery and then go in person and and see what's happening what this community found was that there was um, an illegal incursion on their territory. 40 acres had been uh, cleared to plant coca uh, by somebody from Colombia. And so they were able to document this and bring it to the prosecutor, to the Peruvian government. And actually a year later, uh, the government was able to remove this illegal settle, settler there. So this is the video shows a little bit of that. I will share a link with you later on the whole video so you can, if you're interested in watching this case. This is the footage from the drone. Oops, my apologies. This is I'm trying to advance. Oh, here, here we go. Um, so actually the interesting part is that this community was linked to the training that we carried out in 2014. Sorry, I'm gonna. using DJI like Mavic Mini. And, and the youth involved. Um, so the interesting part here is that uh, this community was trained by the the organizations that we trained back in 2014 so even though we didn't directly train this community i i feel very happy knowing that the work we started in 2014 five years later has produced uh, produced results and in communication with our colleagues in peru we were working there with idacep which is the um, indigenous peoples of the amazon uh, network they they told us that even the government um, goes to them to ask them for <laughs> training or help with with the drones because um, they were a bit advanced uh, ahead of the curve in in being able to get a training 
And um, one word I want to say about that is that working with the NGOs, with uh, allies such as Rainforest Foundation, for example, has uh, Rainforest Foundation US, Rainforest, uh, Rainforest Foundation Norway, have been very instrumental in working with communities to ensure that the capacity building reaches the local level and also to ensure that the data then that connection is made with the prosecutor's office or the government some of these some of these things are difficult for a community there's a lot of barriers for them to access justice in the country um, so sometimes having an ally as like an NGO, like an NGO can help so I wanted to show you an example here from the Embarawunan indigenous territory in Panama. This is in the Darien, which is right at the border with Colombia impenetrable rainforest. Um, this was another training that we did in Panama. This was following the success of the Peruvian example. We were also invited to do a training with Rainforest Foundation US in, in Panama. And um, the issue there was um, incursions on the territory that there were uh, small farmers that had entered and, and deforested the land and um, the community really didn't have a sense of the extent of that. So this is a North mosaic um, that shows the illegal deforestation caused by legal logging for cattle ranching in particular. And this is about 500 hectares created from 300 photos that were captured with one of our the custom made fixed wing drone that we saw in the beginning um, this is this was over about three different flights and this kind of image can also easily be overlaid on google earth and it has uh, gps coordinates so that you can exactly see where it, where this is when this was presented to the community they were absolutely um, blown away to see exactly where and how much deforestation there was. This particular case had um, a bit of a different outcome because um, the government agreed to help the community get the, the illegal ranchers out. However, it had already been um, a year and the ranchers had sort of settled in and they're also small holders and poor and it, it's a complex, it's a very complex development challenge um, to try to resolve. Before I conclude, I wanted to say a few words about our work at UNDP and how um, I'm working to link my work with Touche of Cereals, which, which is something that I established along with my work at UNDP and um, a Tribaling Foundation, which I had been working as a special advisor as well and um, how I'm thinking about bridging that work here at the UN. The UN works on a very large scale, as you can imagine, um, so we have to think more on the policy level. The, at the Nature for Development program, we have a platform called the UN Biodiversity Lab. This, this was created in part, NASA partnership and using satellite data to specifically help governments make sense of the data and be able to report to the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, on, their, on their targets and how, how they're fulfilling their targets um, as per the Convention on Biological Diversity. So now that we have this incredible tool, which uh, has over 100 different global spatial data, layers, water, human settlements, wildlife, carbon forests, this helps visualize this, um, the, the data. You can access a private, um, uh, private area on the project, so you can play around and do different scenarios and modeling. You can conduct analyses and create maps, and also you can help um, communicate your success and, and do various case studies and reports using this data. So the idea here is to, and, and of course there's many of these platforms, Forest Watch, Landmark, these are some that are more specifically about indigenous peoples. Um, there's many different platforms that indigenous peoples and local communities can use to uh, study or be able to um, research their territories and also uh, bring in data if they so wish, uh, respecting the principles of indigenous data sovereignty, of course. Um, so the idea here is to make sure that the UN Biodiversity Lab, even though it was designed for, for decision makers at the government level, 
the question we're posing now is how can it be useful for indigenous peoples and so um, that's part of the goal is to one build the capacity of indigenous peoples and local communities to use frontier technology like drones but also satellites gps and so on and two how can this data be uh, brought into platforms such as the UN biodiversity lab this is just an example of how we've used the biodiversity lab to identify what we're calling essential life support areas basically the key areas to map protect to protect and manage and um, just some images from the workshop in Peru that I mentioned here on the left side and on the right hand side from um, Panama just uh, the importance of uh, scaling and capacity building for indigenous peoples to strengthen their efforts to protect their territories as they're the the most um, effective stewards of the territory of the land and i believe that's i leave you with this image of the the villages in panama which the indigenous peoples were able to see for the first time from an aerial perspective if you go to google right now it's kind of a smudge um, <laughs> but a drone enables you to see quite clearly the the territory thank you so much oh this is great thank you so much nina really fascinating um and we have a number of questions but i'll, I'll save those until uh, until we conclude so finally um i also have the pleasure of introducing mr burhan yasin um, burhan is the chief operating officer for the rainforest connection and a longtime veteran of the tech industry Boran has over 15 years experience in building and leading large-scale manufacturing and engineering teams in several Bay Area companies, including Powis and Zazzle, as well as the leading Dubai-based e-commerce company, Marka VIP, where he served as a longtime CEO before joining uh, Rainforest Connection. Um, Borhan, very thankful you can be here. Um, over to you. Thanks, Erica, and I appreciate being here, and thanks for the GEC to, for having me. Um, yeah, I just, just want to talk real quick about uh, the work that my, my organization does and, um, you know, get into some of, the, some of the work that we do with AI, but also how we use drones as well. Um, let me see if I can actually have access. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Rainforest Connection is a nonprofit organization, um, and we focus primarily on creating technology that uh, can help fight against illegal logging and deforestation. So most of what we do is either field work on the ground or creating, creating the technology that will help um, uh, stop or halt illegal logging and um, uh, deforestation. Now, to take a step back and talk a little bit about sort of what you know why is uh, deforestation is um, it's important to stop deforestation uh, well actually it turns out that deforestation is the second largest contributor to greenhouse gas emission um, and if you compare that to transportation it's actually more than transportation so if you combine all the cars all the ships all the um, uh, trucks out there um, planes etc Deforestation accounts to more greenhouse gas emission, about 17%, uh, than, than, than all of transportation combined. And according, you know, um, I, I think, I think you know, everybody on this call uh, knows how, uh, especially in the most recent years, we've gone through some really, really big devastation, especially in Brazil and places like that, where, you know, um, rainforests once, you know, covered almost 14% of land's earth. And today that's less than 6%. So everybody, you know, all of us have heard about the recent fires in Brazil um, and all, all, all these things. Uh, the researchers are saying that in the next 40 years, if we don't do anything about it, we could uh, essentially consume all of the rainforests that are, that are, that are, that are out there right now. Um, and that translates to almost 50,000 species going extinct every single year. And According to Interpol, 50 to 90 percent of deforestation happens by way of illegal logging. So almost, almost, you know, 50 to 90 percent of it is as a result of illegal activity or illegal logging activities that are happening in indigenous lands and protected areas, 
um, uh, you know, all over the Amazon and, and rainforests around the world. Now, this is an example here of a part of the Amazon that was taken just about 30 years apart. Uh, this is what on the left you see here, what, the, what this aerial shot of this massive piece of land looked like uh, in the Amazon in 1975. You can see there that there is a uh, road uh, that's starting to form um, um, on the right-hand side of that, that, that picture on the left. And that's usually, you know, that usually spells trouble um, anywhere in the Amazon. If there's a road that's being carved in, that's when logging activities uh, start happening more frequently because that's that allows easy access to uh, to the uh, uh, to the forest. And fast forward to 2009, this is what that same exact piece of land looked like. So the devastation is is undeniable, and the amount of logging that occurs in the Amazon and other parts of the world, um, especially by way of illegal logging. Um, is is um, you know unquestionable. Now, what do we do? So what we do is you know we a, a lot a lot of the a lot of the the solutions to fighting against illegal logging um, is usually a reactive solution. Whether it's uh, satellite imagery or trying to change uh, policies or even doing brute force uh, forest protection by way of rangers. Uh, usually, it's 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 something that happens um, after. Uh, so, for example, in, in in the case of satellite imagery, you're you're usually looking at the devastation uh, first. You know, after they've gone in and logged the area, and it actually shows up on satellite imagery, and that's you know when when you're able to do something about it, or that's when you're able to go in and maybe protect the area, or maybe prevent them from 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 going in again, but what what we wanted to focus on is we wanted to focus on being able to stop the illegal activity while it's happening so being able to create a real time solution to stopping deforestation and what we created is this unique piece of hardware it's actually nothing too complicated it's made out of uh, you know a lot a lot of off the shelf parts but the software that that is housed in this uh in this piece of hardware is actually quite unique and what this device does it's called the guardian um, it sits on top of the tree, about 150 foot, 200 feet on on, on a tree, um, and actually records the sound uh, of the forest. So it's it's it sits. It's self powered by the solar panel arrays that you see. They were custom designed to uh, ensure that we get as much power as possible as as the uh, sunlight is penetrating through the tree canopy. And you know they're they're you know they have an internal battery and power management system. But the idea with these devices is that they're recording audio 24 seven. And this audio is being stored, encoded, compressed, and, it, and it's transmitted to the cloud. And what we do on the cloud here is we actually take all this audio that's uploaded, we analyze it um, in real time using machine learning models, um, uh, convolutional neural networks. And that allows us to pick out very specific sounds. So we can pick out sounds of chainsaws, sounds of vehicles, uh, gunshots, uh, people uh, conversing, et cetera, et cetera, any signs of potential illegal activity. So if somebody is firing up a chainsaw in the middle of the forest, that's an immediate sign that there is logging that's occurring at the moment. So it's, it's one of the first real-time solutions to actually stopping illegal logging. And a single device, a single Guardian device can actually monitor up to three square kilometers of forest. So it's not, you don't need, you know, a, a, a huge number of them. Uh, because we install it really high up on a tree and it has this, uh, you know, ability to sort of, um, you know, monitor a, a large area. So you can, it can actually pick up sounds as far as one and a half kilometers away from every direction. And what that translates to, that translates to by protecting these three square kilometers of forest, it translates to almost 15,000 tons of CO2 that's sequestered every year by keeping these forests alive, by preventing these forests from being cut down and releasing carbon back into the air, et cetera, et cetera. And that's equivalent to basically taking 3,000 cars off the road. So a single device that is installed in the forest is equivalent to um, essentially taking 3,000 cars off the road for a whole year. And 
the reality of it is actually these devices can offer even more protection, even wider area protection. And why is that? It's because we install them in very strategic locations that, uh, that basically enables us to monitor the perimeter. So the idea is that if we have a particular uh, forest, uh, you know, at, uh, let's say an indigenous land that we want it to protect, by protecting the perimeter, by protecting all the points of entry into that land, we're essentially protecting everything inside of it, correct? So these devices have far more impact than the three squ square kilometers that I mentioned, provided that they are installed in very strategic locations. And that's what we do every time we, we um, every time we actually go in there and, 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 and install uh, these devices or go in there and provide protection for a particular, uh, particular piece of land. So this is this is an example, one of the early sort of one of the early ways by which we used uh, sound patterns um, and um, uh, frequency changes to detect chainsaws before we actually introduce convolutional neural networks. Um, and that's how we would detect uh, chainsaw activities in the forest from the sounds that we're picking up and, and uploading to to the cloud. Um, and here's another example that I just wanted to show the massive differences between what a chainsaw and, and how big of an issue, a problem it is to actually, or, or you know, it, it's quite a unique challenge to try to solve the problem of detecting chainsaws in the forest. So what you see here is a, a spectrogram representation of a chainsaw that's picked up using a popular data set by Google called AudioSet, a chainsaw from another uh, uh, data set called ESC50, and what a chainsaw looked like in the in the rainforest, and you could see basically the difference between a chainsaw um, uh, sound in the middle of the forest, in the middle of a very active environment full of life and full of species and 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 creatures, versus in situations where a chainsaw is being used in urban environments or is being used in other places. It's quite a unique challenge. So what we did is we actually collected over 22,000 recordings. And I think this number today is probably triple that and trained a convolutional neural network, an artificial intelligence model uh, based on machine learning to be able to pick out the sound of chainsaws. And we achieved approximately 90% uh, accuracy in terms, of, in terms of the performance of the model. And we keep, because, because we, primarily utilize cloud as our as the way to do analysis we're able to improve on this model and we're able to um, uh, revise this model as much as we want and immediately deploy it to all of the sensors out there that are actually picking up the sounds so that's kind of the the methodology that we use to, to be able to to pick out sounds of chainsaws or any sounds of illegal activities here's an example of one of a one big project that we have um, at the moment, actually, our team is is currently on the ground installing about 30 sensors in a uh, 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 another part of this indigenous land. In the Amazon, there is a uh, tribe called the Tembe. Uh, this is the Tembe indigenous land. It's uh, the territory is called Alto Rio Guama, and this is this this is approximately 2,800 square kilometers, so it's almost 1,100 square miles. And the Tembe actually lives all the way up here in the north and all the way up here in the, so uh, in the south. And most of this area that you see here in the middle um, is actually not controlled by the Tembe because it's been either illegal settlers or drug plantations or you know, obviously massive illegal logging activities that are occurring. So we started this project about four years ago and our aim was to um, help the Tembe protect their land. Um, Erica, I know, I know you just came up. Is, am I running out of time or? We're running short on time. Yeah. Okay. All right. uh, sorry, Borhan, but yeah. No, no worries. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> yeah so, um, so basically we work with them directly to, to protect some of the last remaining forests that they have, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, available basically. And uh, this is what the Tembe looks like. These are the Tembe people. There's about 2,900 of them. Um, this is um, an example of our um, model being run and, and available in real time. And this is a Tembe warrior after a successful patrol, actually stopping um, illegal loggers and taking over this, uh, this bulldozer here. Um, threat monitoring system. And 
the last thing, and, and this is how I'm going to piece it together with 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 drone. Um, basically, part of what we do, you know, we focus our entire organization on threat detection, right? But along the way, as I mentioned earlier, we were recording the entire soundscape of the forest. So we were recording the forest 24/7, and part of that was this this amazing. Uh, 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 data set that we've collected over 80 years of audio that is full of life, full of biodiversity, and full of all these potential insights for scientists and researchers. Um, and the way our devices are deployed is that our devices rely on the GSM cell phone network. But in places where the cell phone network is not available, which in the case of the Tembe, it's only available in the north and the south, but nothing in, in between, we actually use something called short data burst, which is an Iridium satellite uh, uh, way of uploading data, very small packets of data. And what that does is allows us to continue to send alerts in real time for illegal activities, but we cannot send the audio for biodiversity purposes. So we store the audio on the device, on the sensor itself. The sensor actually establishes basically like an FTP network. And we utilize, we've done this as a pilot project in Ecuador with Conservation International, where we use drones to come in and retrieve the data. This is super compressed data that uses a very, um, an encoding technology that we've actually developed. And we're able to retrieve that data and upload that data into the system that you see here called Arbimon that allows researchers and scientists to take this information and make use of it, right? So that's kind of how we're using drone technology for, for biodiversity purposes. Uh, this is another way of visualizing data. I'm running through this, sorry about that. And you know, today Rainforest Connection is, uh, have done data collection and works and projects, some, some for illegal logging and, and others for biodiversity specifically in over 38 countries. And this is what we're hoping to achieve um, in the next three years. And lastly, uh, if you all want to interact with the data, you can actually access some of these sensors and hear them in real time. All you have to do is go on your app store and download the Rainforest Connection app, and you'll be able to hear these sensors um, in real time as they broadcast from the middle of the forest. Thank you very much. Thanks, Erica. I'm sorry if I went over the no, time. No, no worries. And, thank uh, thank you. you thank you so much, Borhan, and for sharing no your worries. groundbreaking you. work. It's such important work. Um, and everyone, I'm so sorry that we we don't have time um, for Q and A. And and I had so many. I wanted to know about your favorite forests that you've worked in. But everyone, I I hope you enjoyed our presenters' um, presentations. I I know I did. Um, so thank you to our attendees today. Thank you so much to our presenters. Uh, we look forward to um, carrying this conversation forward. And we also wish everyone a peaceful and inspired Earth Day tomorrow and every day. Um, so take care. Be well. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.